thing just came up on Twitter, but I don't hear anything. I don't hear the music. JT, you hear it? Nope. Tim, don't hear the sound. I don't know if Tim can hear us. Tim, can you hear us? Tim? All right. They're down by 14. And Toretta intercepted by Teague. George Teague to the end zone. Touchdown. The hall is now right in the middle. That's his quick. Passes away, penalty flag down. Lamar Thomas has got it. Lamar Thomas is on his way down the sideline. George Teague is after him and runs him down. Takes the ball. Takes the ball away from him. Teague's got the ball. And they tackle Teague back at the 12. Game's over. Alabama defeats Miami. Number two beats number one, 34 to 13. Blitz on from the one. And they throw fade right side of the end zone for Owens. He got both feet in. Touchdown catch over the shoulder. Here we go. Here we go. There oh, goes Owens. Puts there it down. Go. And he levels it. Here it goes. Here it goes. And now Teague here it is comes. aimed at by an offensive lineman. Flozell Adams pulls Teague away. And Owens is waved to the bench. And he stands in the middle of the star and holds the ball out. Let me tell you something, Brad. Terrell Owens started it. Emmett Smith went out to the 50, trumped him. Now Terrell Owens comes back, and George Teague said, you know what, I'm not going to take this. Good for George Teague. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Teague's Take. Uh, alongside George, virtually alongside George, JT, I am Tim, and we've got another great show for you here tonight. And as you can see, we are still virtual on the virtual side of COVID. Uh, we're doing the best with what we got. We want to thank everybody that's watching live on Facebook, live on YouTube, live on Periscope. We do have the comments section open. If you're on one of those streaming platforms, you're welcome to check in with us and ask a question, make a comment. We've got a very special guest, another very special guest to the show tonight. Another one of George's buddies, the great George Hegeman joins us tonight. George, how are you tonight? Man, I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, it's very few times people use great in front of my name, so I'm going to take it. <laughs> well, I remember your playing days here in Dallas. I call it like it is. Heck, you got one of those Super Bowl rings from the 90s, so you're always going to be great to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got one of them. George, tell us, uh, George Teague, tell us a little bit about how you know George. Man, so me and Big G go back a long ways. I, I, I do consider him a, a really good friend, uh, a mentor, um, and just someone I can always bounce ideas off. And so we met, ooh, dang, has it been that long? I was about to say 16, man, it ain't been quite 15 years ago, but it's been a while. <laughs> you know, because he was playing at the Cowboys while we were still in the league um, yep. together. So we, yeah, I guess that would have been '94. Um, I didn't get there to '96 though, so it would have been there last year. Yeah, it would have been 1996 when we actually first met. Um, and you know, we just started a relationship and and building and bonding, and we've crossed some paths in ways um, outside of professional football that we'll probably touch on a little bit uh, as far as high school football goes and uh, combines. And there's just so much that we have to, uh, to talk about uh, with that. So, you know, with him being a third round draft pick, 
uh, to the Dallas Cowboys and, and coming in and doing his things. I, I, I love him the most because he's a serious motivator, man. Everything he has to say is about positivity. Um, you know, sometimes we do get negative on here, and, and especially when we talk about LSU. <laughs> People like that. Um, but the Big G knows how to bring the heat, man. Um, I promised him, Tim and JT, that I would only crack on him one time. No joke. One joke. Uh, one like, time. You, you want to get it now? You only get one. <laughs> well, I'm going to get it now. Okay. Oh, here we I'm go. I'm going to get it now and go ahead and get it out of the way. And I'll try not to slip up later on in the show because I did not know <laughs> that you were, and I read this quote. Uh-huh. The largest player in the Large. 1994 draft. Large. What the heck did that mean? How, how big are you, brother? That, that's 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 the truth. That's the truth. So so now understand. So I came in the same draft with Larry Allen. Yep. Right. So so I remember when I got there. You know, of course, when you go to the combine, like they parade you around like me, basically, and just a pair of little boy shorts the whole weekend. So you go the way in and they take you in this room. And like I said, so when you get there, it's all the offensive linemen in one room. And like when we walk in, it's quiet. Then all of a sudden I walk in and you hear all this, this, this low murmuring, you know, <laughs> I'm like, hey, <laughs> so I'm all, you already self-conscious because you walking around with your man meat showing, you know, with <laughs> these little boy shorts on, and then you get on the scale, then you get on the scale, oh my God. So, so I weigh, so I, I'm six, seven. And at that time I was 357 pounds. So at that time, that was the biggest person to ever come through the combine. So how close was Larry to you at the, at the draft? That's the thing is Larry is about six, four, six, four. And I think Larry was about, he's always been the same about 310, 320. At at the draft, at the draft, I don't know what he is now, what he played at. But who, who right. was faster? Were you faster than him, or you know, he's pretty fast, little dude now. Nah, Larry, you know, Larry, as you know, T up close, <laughs> like that dude, that dude was special. That dude, <laughs> that dude was special. But but you know what? It, I'm a, Larry knows. I always say this. I remember the first time. We get drafted. He's the second round draft pick. I'm the third round draft pick. We we show up to the Cowboys together for rookie camp. And we're going through that first camp. And Shantae Carver was the number one pick that year. And I remember we were sitting there watching Huss and Hunt work out with Larry and thinking to ourselves, there is no way this guy is a second round draft pick. Like there's there is no way. Like he just looks so uncoordinated. He looked like he just didn't belong until he hit somebody. <laughs> and when he, I can't, I, it was, it was matter of fact, it was Godfrey Miles that he ended up hitting in shorts, rolled Godfrey over about three times or whatever. So Larry's power and strength has always been his asset. And then, believe it or not, him coming from a small college like Sonoma State, you know, a lot of people didn't know who he was. I remember us looking at his highlight film thinking it was his highlight film, but it was actually a whole game of Larry. <laughs> That's how he was doing people, play after play after play after play. So, you know, obviously the rest is history, but, you know, that whole team has some superstars, man, for sure. Well, I have to admit that it was terrifying to see Larry Allen come out on those little wide receiver screens where they mm-hmm. try to put those guys on defensive backs. Yeah. And I, I always follow Dion's. Uh, motto of making the right business decision and not trying to take on <laughs> uh, any of you linemen that were coming out there to try to get a hold of us smaller defensive backs. So hey, when we can get you, we are gonna get you. That's, that's I know. Yeah, <laughs> that's you gotta get you. You got an opportunity because they don't come too often for you guys. That's right. Well, I might as well dig in deep because uh, about these guys taking shots. You know, I gotta see how you feel about this offensive line of the Dallas Cowboys. I know they're banged up and a lot of different things are happening. Um, so I, I want to ask you a directed question first. And it's really just, I'm just really kind of curious because I know tackles are a little bit different than guards that are 
different than the center. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have a center going down or getting hurt and you maybe have to move someone in or find the backup, how hard is it really to go from guard to tackle to center? And what, you know, what are the different things you have to think about by, by the positions? So, so it's a good question for me to ask. So I've always been a versatile lineman, like my entire career. I was always asked to do different things. What they're facing specifically right now is like not a lot of power in the middle. Like that's one of the things that I see. And then quite frankly, we've been so spoiled having Tyron Smith at left tackle all these years that it's obvious when he's not there. Then you look at Steele, you know, trying to hold it down for Lyle Collins. I mean, you can just tell there is a different group of guys. It's a different group of guys in there. So the biggest thing that, like, comes to me with them is the lack of continuity. The lack of continuity and, and honestly, a lack of confidence, uh, to be honest with you. And we were actually talking about this in the pre-show. It's not that they're really doing all that bad, but – where you do see them struggle is in the crunch time moments. You know, when you got to get that third down, or you got to get that, get that first down conversion. They don't have the guys up front that's used to running the scheme the way that they're used to running it and running it together. So mishap here, fall step here, not a good angle here, not a good target there. You know, whereas you're used to playing with some guys, you know, like you think about it, Travis Fredericks, all the years that he's played, he's been so consistent that you can tell when there's not when he's not in the middle anymore. And when your point isn't strong, it weakens everything else. And I got to be totally honest with you. It's not that the guys that are in there right now are doing so bad, but there is a huge difference when you talk about the five that we're used to versus the five that's in there now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh I mean, I, I know that those injuries hit him hard. I, I like what you're saying about the continuity. Um, I could see that being an, an issue. But do you think any of this other stuff plays into it with, uh, you know, co I mean, you're still coaching. And yep. uh, we need to talk about that. But, you know, how does this – how has this pandemic and lack of offseason, does it really affect, you know, you guys up front – the way I may think it may affect guys in the back. Yeah. So, so I like to add a layer to that T, you know, so I go to the combine and I speak, you know, to the incoming rookies every year, you know, about what that transition is going to look like. So, you know, what the combine is, you know, you got all 32 teams there. So that means you got all 32 coaches at each respective position. I've had the ability, the, the fortune, I should say, of being able to sit down and kind of talk to them about how they proceed now with the new collective bargaining agreement first. And the reason why we actually had those conversations, is because when I asked them, what types of guys are you looking to draft or looking to come on the team? Now it has to be guys that know how to learn very quickly. Whereas in the nineties, you know, when I got drafted, you got drafted, you know, they believed in developing guys. Well, one of the reasons why they believed in developing them is because they had the time to. But now there are major restrictions on how much time you can actually spend in the offseason with new players. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, you look for the guys that you, you know, you're not going to have a whole bunch of time to spend to teach them a system. They almost got to come ready, rock and roll. Whereas before you could get a Larry Allen that came from Sonoma State develop them over the off season because you had them in there almost every day, sometimes nine hours a day, teaching them scheme, working on footwork, those sorts of things. You can't do that now. So now take that and then throw in the element of COVID where now the little time that you did have, you're doing virtually now. Well, I don't know about you. It's kind of hard to teach footwork and target on a computer. <laughs> That's <laughs> hard to do. That's that's hard to do. So, yeah, it does. It plays a huge uh, uh, problem in it. So let's, let's kind of flip flop that a little bit. When you look at the teams that are the most successful now, they've had that continuity. But the teams that, you know, are kind of reforming and trying to uh, redevelop, those are the teams that are struggling, particularly in this type of environment, 
because the hands-on part of it is, is far and few in between right now because COVID's not allowing it. Collective bargaining agreement is not allowing it. So therefore, you got to have ready rock and roll guys, though. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I mean, it makes sense to me because it, it's been hard for, for me just to try to figure out, uh, you know, like you said, all the smaller things uh, that you need to teach people when you don't have the, the time on the field. Uh, <laughs> you know, with large groups, especially if you're quarantined and things of that nature. That's yeah, right. yeah, because you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, so I'm down here at IMG Academy, so we're on a, we're on a campus. So the thing that's been unique about our situation is we've been in what you can consider a pseudo bubble, right? Meaning, you know, in terms of our kids, we've been able to keep them probably as safe as you could probably keep teenagers. Uh, in terms in terms of just potting with uh, each position, having a campus where they don't really leave campus unless it's for sport or to go home on weekends. Um, so and then our protocols have been such where we've been very stringent about wearing masks, about traveling with specific groups and, and so on and so forth. And because of that, it does. It, it takes a lot of the extra time and then the thing is once you get indoors you can only have but for a certain amount of bodies not just kids but coaches included in one room at a time you know and then we try to limit the amount of time that we're in rooms together so it does it's it's created uh you know a a really tough situation uh for us and, and we're isolated so i can imagine what it must be, you know, for you guys, T, you got your kids going back and forth on home every day, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a little bit more tough to do, you know. And, and then, look, I'll be the first one to tell you, 2020 has been extremely crazy for just living life. So try to throw sport on top of it. Good luck. Man, we need to talk about AMG a little bit because there's probably a lot of people don't even know what that is. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, so you want to tell us, uh, um, you know, what what – what IMG is and your role with it? So IMG Sports Academy is down here in Bradenton, Florida, and we are a high school for elite elite student athletes. Um, So we got all sports. We got basketball, football, baseball, soccer, tennis, track, um, lacrosse, uh, men's and women's basketball, baseball, I believe I said, uh, golf we also have. Um, The only thing we don't have is swimming and volleyball, believe it or not in terms of uh, major Title IX sports. So we have three football teams, a varsity team, which which plays a local Florida schedule. We have a national team, which plays obviously national football games with the number one team in the country right now. And then we have our post-grad team, which I'm also the head coach of. We just finished out our season this year. Uh, For the first year, we played four games, finished two and two. Uh, We helped fifth year seniors uh, have an extra year to develop before they go off to college. Uh, we've got about 1,100 students on campus right now at all respective sports. Um, and it's a place where we literally teach a lot of the student athletes how to transition from high school into college. And a lot of our kids, we, we have, I look at it this way, we have three different groups of kids. We have power five kids and that's at every sport. Then we have the kids that are the Patriot League kids, the uh, Ivy League school kids. And then we have the kids that are still trying to figure out which route they're going to go. But the the best way to put it, we're a campus that allows uh, student athletes to be able to learn their their respective sports like pros. Right. So it's it's year round. It's normal high school um, in that regard. But in the way that we train, the way we teach, the way we mentor is pretty high level. Man, that's awesome. So what states do you run into problems with when you have to play them? Uh, who, Texas. Who don't <laughs> never won none. Texas never wants none. Texas, <laughs> and, and look, so we we came out there this year, and all I'm going to say, somebody scored 41, somebody scored 14, you know, versus a school down in Duncanville, Texas. Um you know, but but here, here's the deal. I, and I understand where it comes from. You know, our kids come from all over the country. Florida, Texas, California, Arizona, Alabama, Georgia. We get kids from all over the country that come to the school. 
So there is a bit of animosity in, in terms of a lot of their larger talented kids coming, you know, coming to school with us. Um, but at the same time, it's up to the discretion of, of the kid and, the, and to the parent. You know, I, I think that everything we do, and I, I lay my, my hands on it, I think everything we do is pretty above board. You know, we're very honest about what it is that we do. We're non-apologetic. We give kids and families an opportunity to be able to develop on, at a high school level, but with a pro mentality. And we don't make any type of, you know, apologies for that. You know, and because of that, you know, certain states choose not to play us. T. Well, like, what, like, why is that? Well, I'm going to say this, and I want what your answer, and just because you brought it up. Um, but some will say that you recruit their kids because you recruit nationally, you go play the best ones, and then because you're a national type school, that it's easy for you to contact their quarterback or their running back or their lineman and then tell them to come on down to Florida. So, you know, how do you dispel that? What do, what, what would you say to, you know, the – Coach so, so again, like I said, everything that I know that we do in terms of how we get, you know, the kids to come to IMG is above board. Uh, just like any other program, we put out there the things that we know that we're good at. And when people inquire about how they how, how can they attend our school, we're not going to say, well, listen, you're from Texas, so you can't come like mm -hmm. that. It's not appropriate. In, in my I just don't see anything wrong with that. But I think the misconception is that we're going around stealing kids and that's just not the end. That's not, it's not it. And, you know, and, and I, I've been a coach on both sides. That, that's here's, here's the biggest thing I've coached at obviously right now, one of the most elite schools in the country. And then I've coached at schools that football, basketball, baseball really wasn't the, the school's main priority. And we still won. I mean, and, and to go into the point, Teague, and we can actually start talking about this. When we started coaching together at Carrollton Christian Academy, we didn't have the most athletic kids in, in, the, in the state. But I think that the product that we laid out there was extremely respectable. And we won football games, you mm -hmm. know, with the kids that chose to go to that school, you know, on their own time and on dime. So, I think it really comes down to, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, the type of culture that you create for your school. If you, if you're creating the right culture and you're treating the kids, right, you're treating the parents, right. You're getting them recruited. They're getting placement. There's, I don't think there's not very much that you need to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Well, and thank you very much for coming to Carrollton Christian Academy when I made that ask for you to come out there and try to help me. Okay, I look, he, he's going to uh, downplay this, right? He's going to downplay this. JT, you were just running around, you know, kicking balls around. <laughs> <laughs> but George gave me my very first opportunity to start coaching. And at that point, I had not really had any formal Coaching, like I've been training, like professional. I've been training offensive linemen since I retired, but I had never coached before. And when I got there, he said, "Listen, I got a spot, but I need you to coach defense." So oh, I told him, "I said, man, I, I've never coached defense, but if that's what you need. I'll figure it out. Learn the defense that you're teaching and go." So he calls me his mentor. He has been my mentor because a, he didn't have to give me that opportunity, right? B, when he gave me the opportunity, he was very honest with me about, listen, you can't do what you know how to do. I need you to learn something else, right, that will actually, actually pay huge dividends for me. And the third thing, man, is he gave me the opportunity to create relationships that I still have with kids like Stephen Land and, you know, and Big Spike and, and, and Jacob <laughs> and all those guys, man. Like, so I'm, I'm extremely appreciative, appreciative of that, man. Speaks to your character. And the things that you're all about, man, I'm just I'm really happy. And I got the opportunity to tell the masses about that, you know, how I actually got into this, which actually led me to where I am right now. No, I appreciate that, brother. I do appreciate that. Hey, so I'm um, Mr. Young. I don't know if you can see the messages or not, but Craig Young wanted to ask you a question. If you can see it there on your screen, okay. how would you answer how hard it? Is it going from a player into a leader role where you try to mold boys into men. 
Man, a uh, loaded question there, Craig. Um, I'm going to be honest, you know, so I have to answer this like this. I've been, T, you can probably say the same thing. I've been extremely fortunate to have leadership around me and the men that coached me from high school to college and college to the pros that I've been able to learn from. You know, my high school offensive line coach and my high school head coach were men of very high integrity. Um, college, the same thing. Uh, and the pros, the same thing. A lot of the players that Teague and I play with are, you know, guys that you look at and you think of as Hall of Fame or superstars. You know, there's a lot of those guys that are Hall of Fame and superstar dads, superstar people. And all I did was just really just learn from a lot of them, you know, to give me the opportunity to, when I knew, I knew very early on in my career that I didn't know I was necessarily going to coach, but I knew I wanted to be the type of mentor that those people were being to me. So to answer your question, Craig, I, I, I follow people who I know do the, do the thing right and they do it right consistently. Tony Dungy is another man that comes um, into play. He was actually the person that actually got me, you know, really thinking about taking coaching seriously in the rest of my history. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, Tony Dungy fan, man. That's a that's a good guy. I had a chance to meet him once and just couldn't, couldn't be a nicer guy on the planet. Man, Tim, I'm, I'm going to tell you. So, you know, and, and I find myself saying Tony Dungy's name more and more often lately. Like I have I have three men that are like really like are true, tried and true uh, mentors to me. So uh, Alan Page, Calvin Hill and Tony Dungy. And like each of them has their own it factor. The thing about Tony, right, is I played for him for two years. I've never I heard the man raise his voice one time. One time I've heard him raise, I've never heard him cuss, fuss, you know, or or or, or say something that was questionable. And the thing, I think the it factor, I said all three of them have an it, an it factor. The thing about Tony is he believes in family. Right. He believes in spending time with family. He believes in playing good football and he believes in you developing yourself, you know, outside of the sport. And every man, I challenge you to find one player, even players that he's cut that can say anything negative about him because he's really that type of dude. Like he really sure. is. I've heard all of the good things about Tony, you know, even from his broadcast partners. There's nothing but good things about him. I love watching him on the uh, Sunday night football broadcast. Just a wealth of knowledge, man. Not just about defense, but about the game yeah. of football completely. He just did He just did a college game last weekend. Last weekend or the weekend before last. And, man, I mean, he, he is so inviting just listening to him talk. Like, I didn't even – it was two really good schools, but I wasn't a fan of either school. I was, I'm was. i a fan of Tony, so I sat there and watched the whole game just because he was calling. I think he should do more of it. Absolutely. So a couple of quick things we want to get with you, get to with you before uh, we let you jet out of here. Um, one, of course, I want to talk about your podcast, which we'll get to. Yeah. In a second, but first, I got to make you brag on yourself a little bit. Am I correct in understanding you have a Ph.D.? No, mm -hmm. I, I, I do not. I do not. Uh, yet. Oh, I, you're working. I, I do not yet. I do not yet. But we are okay. working on it. Thanks, George, for <laughs> I know the, the misinformation. Well, you know, every now and again, I, I know he was working on it. My my point was, Big G, and I, I talked to you about I talk about you with this, with you being one of the smartest people that I know in our football realm, and just from listening to you speak with the amount of public speaking you do, and mm -hmm. I don't even know how this came about, but you were telling me that you were going back to to pursue that yep. shoot most of us are just trying to get our degree or the masters right, you know right. and here you are thinking you're mr so who's better nc state or north carolina Wait a minute, who, oh, which one's the better educational school who, who's better football school. wise oh school. come on this is easy one of the schools Ooh. got caught faking uh class okay. results for an entire <laughs> class of athletes <laughs> those facts and, and the other one is actually making their athletes go to class. So that's right. That's all we gotta say. We don't have to say who let the people do their research. 
let the people do their own research, man. <laughs> Yeah. So we'll okay. brag on the podcast a little bit, George. It's uh, called the Big George Way podcast. Right. It's not right. necessarily about football or coaching, is it? No. Nah, you see, see. Okay. So here's the deal. So Teague, no. Ever since Teague, no, I've already been a big dude. And to see, the thing is, is all the little guys in the locker room always got something to say about the big dudes, right? And that's that's cool. That's fine. But here's the thing I've learned. And if you listen to my podcast, you'll figure this out. I mean, I've been big all my life. Right. So when I was born, I was 12 pounds, four ounces. So I've oh always goodness. been big. It's not it's not as if all of a sudden I became big. I've always been big. So in saying that, man, I've always had to do the everyday, the things that normal people size do, normal size people do. I've always had to do it in a big man way. And because of that, it's always made me had to think a little bit more about where I was going to go, how I was going to get there. And once I got there, you know, what, how I was going to have to augment whatever it was that, that I, I found when I got there. What am I talking about? So just being big, man, you got to be concerned about when you travel, you got to be concerned about where you're going to sit in restaurants. You can't just go anywhere and buy clothing. You can't just go to normal doctors. You can't, you can't do anything normal without putting some thought into it. So what the Big George way is, the Big George way was a way to kind of talk to guys my size about how to navigate life, but not ordinarily, but extraordinarily. So you can tell you, every room I walk into, I walk into like I own it. I do. I walk into it like I own it, and it's because I know who I am. I understand that I'm extremely polarized into most people that I meet. Every single day, somebody's asking me something about my size, and for a long time, man, I did. I used to be you know, I used to look at that as a negative, as a, as a disability, if you will. But it's given me a very unique way of thinking about life. And because of that, I've learned to motivate other people that look like me, walk around on this earth like me on how to just live their life the best way they can. And that they should, because the thing is, when I looked at being polarizing, I looked at it for a while. And I said this before, you know, as being a negative and it's not. It's, it's not a negative. So if I'm going to be this big, I need to be doing something positive. So that's why I opened the podcast up. It's an opportunity, you know, to, for me to talk to people about how to overcome certain things. And it's been great. We're on episode five now, right now. So we're young. We're new. What's that? What's that you got going right there? That's, that's your podcast here. That's it. That's it. That handsome guy right there on the side. <laughs> I was in Miami Beach, you know, taking that picture. Um, but my size, you know, to that to that point, to that picture, my size is the reason why I was actually on that trip, and and where I was taking that picture, I saw a guy close to my size. He was actually running down on the beach, and I went down to talk to him, and then from there, you know, just kind of talking to him about you know certain things that we share in common. I took that picture and decided to use that picture for the podcast. But it's been great, man. It's been fun. I'm having a lot of a lot of fun with it, man. And I would love for more people to come in and, you know, listen, listen here to us. A bunch of motivation, a lot of different things that we talk about has a, you know, I talk about everything, man, from the way that you, you know, get up in the morning. I'm doing, I'm doing what's called the 75 and hard challenge. Has anybody heard of that? Heard of 75 I, I, I have because I listened to your first. Your, your first <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it's stuff like that, man. It's been good. I'm always going to try to find a way to motivate people to do whatever they're doing better than better than they've ever thought about it before. That's awesome. Yeah, so I, so I let's say, hold on, Tim. Let, let me summarize this for, for him really right. quick. Here we go. Because he does a lot of speaking as well. He does speaking engagements and things of that nature. And we'll probably need to make sure we get a plug on how people need to do that if you want to come. You know, he's speaking to all the NFL players and stuff of that nature. But what he's telling you is – if you do contract him to come speak for him, he is going to be in a first class seat. So you better go ahead and budget, you better go ahead and budget that because <laughs> you're not sitting back right there in the back. <laughs> Wait, have, we have to pay to have him on the show tonight. I don't. I don't even want to know about that check. Hey, uh, it is, three is cheeseburgers. Big. It ordered the fries. He, he said he was just got one joke. I'm he asking the question. Sneak another one in. That's him sneaking his second one in. It's another one coming. I know him. He's going to get at least three off. He's going to get at least three. 
Now, Big G, tell everybody how they can get a hold of you. That you got a website, uh, um, yeah. you know, your Twitter, whatever. Yeah. So if they do need to speak to you or follow, yeah. You so or- I, I use I use my Twitter. I use my Twitter, you know, as my as my homepage right now. So it's G Hegeman, G H E G A M I N at George at G Hegeman on Twitter. You can reach out to me, DM me, anything that you guys you know want to talk about. You want to book me for you know for speaking engagements. Or just tune into the podcast, anything, go to Twitter. You can find all the information you need there. Yes, sir. And yes, I just sir. tweeted out a link to uh, your Twitter account nice. with information on your podcast and also some of your uh, earlier opinions about the, the NFL and the offensive lines I tagged you in. So when you're off the show here, you can go check those out. But nice, nice. Send all those out to the Teague Takes, fo- Teague Takes followers and all of my followers as well. And uh, everybody go check that out for sure. Well, man, we appreciate you popping on here with us. It's a shame that we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, but George said, man, don't let him stay on more than 30 minutes, whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been good, man. T, you know, I'll do just about anything for him. I mean, I, I can't, I cannot tell you enough how important it is to have the right mentor at the right time. So like George was, the, he was the right person I needed at the right time. Like the guy is egoless. And I mean that in a very uh, positive way. I mean, he's, he was at that time in my life, I was really trying to figure out which way I was going to go. Uh, and once I figured it out, he opened the door for me. And, you know, as they say, the rest has been black history. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, man. We do appreciate it. We'll have you back on because there's a whole lot more we need to talk about Definitely. In, the near, in the near future. Oh, yep. yes. In the near future. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll be following you and uh, we'll update everybody on how things are going okay. with you. Okay. Sounds good, man. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. All right. There he goes. Mr. George Hageman. The great George Hageman. (laughs) We're going to take a quick break after this, after the word from our sponsors here. We're going to talk about uh, it's time for Money Matters with JHT. JHT. Good Lord. This Dr. Pepper spiked, I promise. Uh, Money Matters with JT. And uh, we're going to talk a little Harbaugh and Michigan. And is it time for him to go, or are they just gluttons for punishment up there? Uh, We're going to get into a little bit of Cowboys talk. There's a new defensive back that could be on the market. Should the Cowboys be interested? And maybe get into a little uh, Jalen Waddle talk, George, maybe. And then uh, some Taps football playoff updates. What do you think of that? Yes, sir. Bring Waddle back, and let's go to these playoffs, baby. Let's do it. There we go. We'll be back right after this. Hey, sports and sports memorabilia fans. This is IndyCar Tim. I want to talk to you about our new friend, Chris Gordon, over at the Cowboy House. CowboyHouseSports.com on the web. Now, Chris is super passionate about all sports, and that's why the Cowboy House is so much more than just a Dallas Cowboy sports memorabilia store. He's got unique game used memorabilia and rare, hard to find autographs for teams across the globe. Everything from the NFL, MLB, NHL, NBA, golf, UFC soccer, Olympics, even from Hollywood and the political sector. And his store isn't just a fancy mall store. It's more of a man cave that he likes to share with his friends and customers. Come on into the store at 209 South Shady Shores Drive, Suite 200 in Lake Dallas, and you can walk on the Texas Stadium end zone turf. You can sit in a chair from Yankee Stadium or Texas Rangers Globe Life Park. Check out hundreds of autographed jerseys from hundreds of teams. Check out thousands of photos signed with certificates of authenticity. He's also got custom framing for all of your sports memorabilia items. Chris Gordon over at CowboyHouseSports.com. 214-551-5978. Thank you, Cowboy House. Need a one-stop shop for Cowboys news and happenings over at the Star in Frisco? Click on over to CowboysSI.com. Featuring Mike Fisher with 30 years experience covering America's team. It's the most popular of all the Sports Illustrated sites and home to the Cowboys Blitzcast podcast. CowboysSI.com is the place to get inside your Cowboys. With such a talented team of writers and reporters over there, you'll always know the latest about personnel and roster moves, salary cap issues, and draft class status. Click on over to CowboysSI.com and always be in the know and get the inside scoop on America's team. The Maverick Bar and Grill in Carrollton, Texas, North Dallas's premier sports bar and grill located at 1616 West Hebron Parkway. It's 16 minutes from just about anywhere in DFW. With all the live action on dozens of TVs and the big screen, it's the place to hang out and watch the return of sports with all of your friends. Friday and Saturday nights, you'll find the best live music in DFW right there at the Maverick Bar. And of course, on Thursday nights at 6 p.m., you'll find us broadcasting Teague's Take live with Alabama and Cowboys legend George Teague. 
Come hang out and be a part of the show. Check out the Maverick Bar and Grill in Carrollton, 972-492-7500 or on the web at themaverickbar.com. Hey, podcast listeners, this is Indy Tim, and I want to talk to you about some friends of ours over at ProfoundSites.com. That's Brent Thomas at ProfoundSites.com for your personal and commercial needs. We're talking about websites built, repaired, secured, maintained, and websites found. Brent Thomas and ProfoundSites.com provide e-commerce development, website development, online marketing, and web, mobile, and e-commerce consulting. With over 10 years' experience, ProfoundSites.com is responsible for the creation of GeorgeTeague.com, where you can hear the George Teague podcast called Teague's Take each week. Brent Thomas and ProfoundSites.com can take you through the entire pain-free process of building your new website. From initial discussion to planning to design, to coding, programming, and then finally the launch. Contact Brent Thomas at ProfoundSites.com or email him at Brent at ProfoundSites.com. Increase time inside your home, noticing all the little things needing attention. Let Repair Resource be your one trusted contractor to tackle all your home repair needs. They do it all, from electrical, plumbing, drywall, to painting and flooring of all types. They can even handle your exterior needs like fencing, patio covers, concrete pads, and decking. No job is too big and no job is too small. Repair Resource does it all. Give them a call at 972-415-1198 or check them out on the web at repair resource Com. Meat Church, do you need to take your barbecue and grilling game to the next level? Check out the great line of products from Meat Church Barbecue. From seasoning and rubs to full-blown recipes like pork belly burnt ends, smoked queso, beef ribs to smoked bologna, and Texas-style brisket, Meat Church has what you need. If your barbecue and grilling game is lacking, check out their barbecue classes and events. They'll help you raise your game to impress your friends and family. If you're in the Waxahachie area, please check out their store at 205 West College Street or give them a call at 214-980-1063 or head on over to MeatChurch.com for a location near you where all their great products are available. Or order directly from them online at MeatChurch.com. Yes, welcome everybody back to the Teague's Take Podcast. Still alongside George and JT, I am Tim. And what a thrill it was talking to the great George Hegeman. Good friend of George Teague's. And I'd kind of like to say now a good friend of mine, even though I still haven't ever met him. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a good dude, man. He's, it's like all your guests do. Just got a ton of stories and just full of full of information it's so great Man, there's so much we'll have to definitely have to get him back in so he can talk about prime time and coaching at trinity christian cedar hill well i don't know if he actually coached there or not but he's been with the the truth with the you know prime time right yeah, probably I mean, got whole show for the stories just from that <laughs> yep I have to ca- might have to catch him on a pregame saturday show or sunday show absolutely that'd be a lot of fun that'd be a lot of fun all right jt it's time for the uh, favorite segment of the show in America, which is Money Matters, and uh, what you got going on this week? Yeah, so uh, Money Matters brought to you by ProfoundSites.com. Um, this week is all about Michigan and Jim Harbaugh. Uh, I think I've actually been on Jim Harbaugh's case for three years now. Um, maybe, maybe I was a little early to the bandwagon uh, of Jim Harbaugh needing to uh, depart from michigan but i think uh i think just about the rest of the michigan fan base has uh joined my bandwagon on harbaugh needing to find somewhere else to coach it took long Uh, yeah i mean they're with you from the beginning but i don't get it yeah so for for those who who aren't aware um michigan is currently one in three uh, in the Big Ten, um, their one win is against Minnesota, which looked impressive at the time. Uh, and then they followed that up with a 27 to 24 loss to Michigan State, which you th- may think, oh, that's not that's not that bad. It was close. Well, it was that bad considering that Michigan State had just uh, lost to Rutgers, who I don't even remember the last time. Had they ever won a Big Ten game? Somebody had to fact check me on that. I don't know. If, had, if they had won a Big Ten conference game before beating Michigan State. Uh, and then they went on the road and lost to Indiana 38-21. to And then Wisconsin baptized them 49-11 um, to uh, last Saturday, holding 
uh, their quarterback to under 100 yards passing. They had uh, they're running, their highest rusher had 21 yards uh, rushing, and uh, their highest receiver had 56 yards. So it, it was not a great day. Um, Jim Harbaugh now, um, this is his sixth season. Um, he is 0-5 against uh, Ohio State. And he's one in five against Michigan State. So I don't understand how there are still Harbaugh apologists now that say that he's he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Now I understand, you know, he's got um eight, nine win seasons, he's got three ten win seasons, but he has one bowl win. It, well, has he ever beaten Ohio State yet? Is no, he, no, oh. he, he's over uh, against Ohio State. And uh, at first it was, well, you know, it's Urban Meyer and nobody's going to beat Urban Meyer's team in the Big Ten. And then Urban Meyer leaves and Ryan Day still curb stomps him um, the year after that. So I, I can understand people saying that, uh, you know, Ohio State is kind of untouchable when it comes to Michigan, but Michigan state is supposed to be little brother. Yes. They're supposed to, and they're bad anyway. You know? they, they're bad. Mm, and they're yet bad. you've beaten them one time. So, so what is your prediction here? I know we're talking about, is this experiment over, but what, what is your prediction with, with this? Is he get fired? Let me, let, me, let me ask you boys this real quick. Uh, Cause this is something that, that I've thought about uh, with the whole Michigan uh, deal with with Harbaugh, so I mean I, I I didn't grow up a Big Ten fan. I'm I'm not still not a Big Ten fan. I did live in Northern Michigan for a short period of time. I uh, worked for a radio station that was on the Michigan State radio network, but I really have no affiliation for either team. But I love college football. I love college football rivalries. Clearly, Michigan Ohio State is one of the biggest. Um, I I almost feel like. Maybe my my personal vision of Michigan or opinion of Michigan is overblown as this Big Ten college football powerhouse historically, as this storied program, as this you know this this I, I don't know with this this historic you know powerhouse. Because I went back and I, I I thought well you know because maybe they're just not not that and here's why I went back and looked at some records. All right, clearly you think of Ohio State, you think of national champions, uh, you think of 12-win seasons, where they have eight 12-win seasons just in the last decade. Michigan has one 12-win season ever. <laughs> you know, so I, I think I have to look at this from the standpoint, well, maybe I just thought they were way better than they really are, and maybe this is just – the, that's what the program is. You know, it's an eight, nine win season every year that once every 10 years can maybe uh, play for a, or be in the talk of the national championship. And, you know, they're, they're getting good recruiting seasons from people in the area, but, you know, nationally they just can't compete. So I, what do y'all think about my overblowing that the entire program of Michigan into being something that they're not? You know, I, I think I think you're probably right. I mean, at least since the turn of the century, they've sure. been above average. Uh, I won't say great, but they've been above average. Um, the the biggest issue that I have with what Michigan was, uh, and because I I'll I'll give them a pass for not having twelve win seasons because. Um, you, you play 12 anyway, and basically you can just chalk up one loss to Ohio State. And sure. then maybe you get tripped up by somebody like Penn State uh, since they are on the same side. They definitely have the harder side of the Big Ten, and it's not unreasonable for them to lose two games. Um, it is unreasonable to be sitting here looking at an eight-game schedule and thinking, oh, my goodness, they might actually only go one and seven including a loss to Rutgers and a winless Penn state Maryland, and then get smacked around and uh, 
at Ohio State again because that's just par for the course now. Um, so, yeah, I kind of agree. Michigan is not – they aren't who we thought they were, um, and but they still have been let off the hook sure. <laughs> many, many times. Well, I, I think there's bigger issues with that too. I think you're all hitting on the good points, and I, I think that – he, I don't know how well of a recruiter he is, which he's supposed to be the quarterback guru. And I don't he know that he's produced it. He's been there. Have they had a quarterback since they've been there? No, and that's that no. was kind of one of the other things that I was going to say was that, you know, you, you went from – he went from um, coaching at San Diego, the University of San Diego, which was in Drake's conference, and he had a good transfer quarterback that went in there. Um, and then – he goes to Stanford and he actually he turned Stanford around. They went four and eight and then like five and seven mm-hmm. and then ten wins. And then, you know, he's he did what he was supposed to do. And then he goes to Michigan because he's, you know, the Michigan man. Mm-hmm. Yep. And looks through the first four years just like the guy they fired, which was Brady Hoke. And there are, there are, you know, he's better than Brady Hoke in some respects and about the same in others. I mean, he does, he has won 70% of their, his games, but I don't. Like no one in Michigan is calling for his head. Like he's just the chosen one and he can do no wrong. I mean, yeah, I mean remember, they, there was talk in Michigan about giving him a quote unquote lifetime I contract. Yeah. I don't think that'll happen. I, uh, here's my I prediction. Can't. I, I, here's my prediction, though, especially because they haven't given him an extension yet, and I don't know how they can give him an extension. I think he has one more year left on his contract. He does. But I think he's a, a prideful man as well, and he don't want this either. I know he, he's given a good talk. We go to work. We do our stuff. I think come January, end of December, he starts trying to find a pro job, go back, be a quarterback coach or assistant head coach somewhere. Um in the pros again. There's going to be some openings. There's going to be some things that happen after this COVID season, and I think he'll be a candidate. And he won't get fired. He's already working behind the scenes, and he's going to walk away gracefully and find his job. That That's my prediction. I, I, I don't – of course, I don't have any insight one way or another, but you don't want to get fired from Michigan because otherwise he's going to be coaching at <laughs> – you name the small school that he's going to have to go to. Yes. <laughs> no, he won't be coaching yeah. at Rutgers because Rutgers already beat him. We're going to beat him this year. Um, but, you know, his recruiting classes have not been bad. Um, he was – they were number eight in 2016. Um, I think 2017, mm-hmm. they were in the top ten. Uh, they were number five. 2018, they had a down year, but down year was like 20-something. <laughs> they were eight in 2019. And this past recruiting class was was 14. So they're not – these are not – they're not devoid of talent. No, because people are going to go to Michigan just because it's Michigan. You're right. Go to Ohio State, you're going to go to Bama. You know, there's a few places, top 10 schools that – A&M. Guys are going to go – oh, gosh. <laughs> no, so maybe that's where he can go coach. Number five, baby. Because I don't know how – Jimbo Fisher going to make it on oh, his 10 year contract. He has. Ranking system that does not have AM ahead of Florida in the top 10 is, is invalid and irresponsible. <laughs> you know, All right. right. On topic. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, so the last thing I want to say is it's a sad day when all of the, all of the directional Michigans might be better than the university of Michigan. <laughs> than the U. Yeah, for sure. Ah, uh, come on. You go a little far putting Central Michigan in front of them. I don't know. I guess that's I not – is that not a direction? Central uh, yeah. Place. yeah, no, Central. I don't think it's <laughs> However, <laughs> if you had to pick today, who would be better, Central Michigan or Rutgers? Mm. And the fact Central. that you are – the fact that you have to think about it that long means that Central Michigan might actually – be better today than the University of Michigan. They definitely Probably. get beat by Western Michigan. Probably more Ooh. exciting to watch. Well, I don't know. You know, I think there's some – I just – I think you guys are right. I think there's some problems going up there, whether or not they 
have the galls to let him go um, or, or whatnot. I, I don't know if he's the Michigan man. He's the guy we got to give him time. COVID year, maybe he gets COVID. No, relief everybody, get one more. everybody's dealing with COVID, and it's not looking good for. It, it's not looking good for Michigan. It's not looking good for Penn State. Ohio State is still taking care of business. Indiana is taking care of business. Wisconsin is taking care of business. Iowa's taking care of business. These are these are schools that are not supposed to be their middle of the pack at best. Well, I don't know. We hope he keep his job. Uh, but I don't think he I don't think he can. I don't think he can withstand it. No, I think no, I don't think they fire him either. I think if he doesn't if he doesn't find a new job and leave, I think they just let his contract expire. So he's because Jason Garrett him? Yes. They just let his contract uh, expire and not offer it, him a new contract. Yes. And and I think that's because um when you do things like hire the Michigan guy, which I don't really like those hires at any school. Uh when you hire a guy that's like supposed to be the prodigal son or whatever. Right. Because it makes it hard for you to get rid of them. Because mm. so that's Bible your can't, Bama can't hire uh Dabo is what you're saying. I personally I would I wouldn't like it. It's I, I think Dabo is a little bit uh it's a little bit tougher, but I think if I if I stuck to what I believe in, I would say that Alabama should not hire Dabo because if Dabo does in fact come in and they go like eight and five three years in a row you know how hard it is it's gonna be for alabama to be like yeah we got to get rid of this dude yeah yeah okay but if, if you bring in if you bring in somebody <laughs> else that has no ties to alabama whatsoever and they go eight and five three years in a row you can be like yeah no we need we'll we'll cut ties with this dude and get him out of here so I, when you when you bring in people that are close to the program uh <clears throat> when you bring in guys like Oh, what's his name? Mike Nolan, who is close to the head coach. And you're like, hey, you're doing a terrible job. You need to leave, except you can't tell him you need to leave because you have this personal relationship with him. It's just it's not it's you're putting yourself in a bind all the time. And that's why even though Kirby Smart and uh, Mark Rick are the same coach, basically, to date, they're not mm -hmm. going to get rid of Kirby Smart either because right. they well. spent all this time trying to get him. Not saying that Kirby Smart should be fired. My my last comment about this, and it's been a great topic, and I really appreciate us being able to talk about this. But I think that leaders, and especially of institutions like you know ones in Michigan or any other uh, powerhouse or presumed powerhouse schools, those ads um, and board of trustees or whatever, you have to make tough decisions for the betterment of your program and if people aren't getting it done someone needs to walk in and say friend or not sorry <laughs> you know we're still gonna go have our glass of wine or whatever it is that they drink um but we gotta move on and we can do this in a way that's good for both of us kind of uh, similar to what jerry did to jason garrett but you know anyway so, so for sure you know national institutions like uh Michigan don't like to be national laughing stocks like they are now. And speaking of national laughing stocks, the Dallas Cowboys <laughs> still what need segue. defensive help. Uh, and on Monday, one defensive back became available as on Monday, charges were dropped in Florida against former New York Giants cornerback DeAndre Baker. Uh, of course, he was released this past offseason due to his alleged involvement in an armed robbery in Florida. On Monday, the state attorney's office dropped the charges against him and charged South Florida attorney William Dean with extortion because, according to several reports, Dean told Baker's attorney that his clients, the three men who recently released statements um, accusing him, recanted those statements, uh, saying, quote, they would do anything you want so long as the money is right, end quote, and attempted to extract $266,000 per client from Baker. So he is still, of course, on the commissioner's exempt list because of this, but there's no question he'll be removed from it uh, expeditiously. Expeditiously. I'll figure out what the word is. Here, there you go. <laughs> I like my other one better. 
Um, and he has shown interest already, uh, drawn interest from the Chiefs. He is expected to meet with the Chiefs tomorrow. Um, I have heard rumblings in Cowboys Nation that there is interest from the Cowboys. Now, he's not your uh, not your, your playmaker that, that you're looking for, but he's a body. Uh, it, the notes here say that he played in all 16 games as a rookie. Of course, the 30th overall pick in the 2019 draft. He had eight pass breakups and 61 combined tackles as a rookie with the Giants last year. So he may not be the playmaker you're looking for, but can he be any worse than what they have at this point? Uh, no. no. They need to, we need to make a really good move at him because um, I know someone will talk about history or whatnot, and I, you know, I, I have to admit I'm probably more emotional about this than I need to be uh, because this – William Dean, dude, or whatever. I think that it is a problem, man. Uh, it's a problem for players. Um, you know, when people can make accusations, extort, you know, all these kind of things and really potentially harm or end people's careers. And it's definitely going to change this guy's money because whatever he comes back from is not going to get the same kind of money that he probably is deserving of. Sure. So I, I'm taking a very, very big uh, heated stance with with this dude as I was looking into this, and it's just – it's wrong. We always talk about the wrongs that players do, um, you know, and they are wrong, some of the things, when you're hitting women or you're doing crazy shit and all that kind of stuff. But when you got other people that are harming the athletes and it kind of – you know, slides on through, you just, you know, oh, it's been dropped. And so he can come back. That's not enough <laughs> in my eyes. You know, this sure. guy needs to be prosecuted to the fullest and thrown in the jail or whatever it is that can happen. So I, I know I'm going on a rant. I apologize for that or whatnot, but I think it's just awful that something like this can happen to a guy that's drafted, has at least a promise career um, started. You know, and then right. it's erupted because interrupted uh, because someone just wants to make some claims. And oh man! By the way, can we while we're on the on the topic, can we question the brain power as an attorney of William Dean, who targets DeAndre Baker for extortion <laughs> as a rookie in the league that no one's ever heard of? Yeah, Dude, why, man? What the crap? Uh, <laughs> hey, you know I mean. I mean, if you're going to extort somebody, you got to extort somebody that you can be credible with, right? You can, <laughs> he can't go after Tom Brady. I guess. That's who I'd go after. Uh, $266. Something. Well, he could have went after him because he probably would have got that check by somebody else. It was that times three. It was 266 per client. So, you know, you're pushing a million bucks there. I mean, does he have that kind of money laying around as a rookie? Is this guy's picture up? I didn't, so I didn't find a picture yeah. or something. I need yeah, to see what this dude looked like, you know, because that's that's right. awful. But I, I do think that the Cowboys need to take a look. Trayvon Diggs going down with a broken foot. Um, I know we're getting a, a woozy A back um, coming off the hamstring. But still, um, there's depth. Um, there's different things that you need to have. And if he's – was scouted and recruited to be that high. I think we should at least try to make a run. I don't think the money's going to be too, too high, you know, um, no. for him. Regardless, it, it, no one's going to overpay him. Um, Ooh, and we need to get. Shot. My, oh, you did. Yeah, I, guess I need to try to find that too. There you go. I can. Uh, we can. We can show the. You working on it? You got this. Uh, got this down here. Well, we're trying to work this back in of. What did, what did you tell me the last couple of weeks? Trying to try something on the fly. What well, you're the, on the fly? Yeah. Uh, and JT yeah. always talks about that because of his data stuff. Of yeah, about know, not doing live demos. Yeah, go. not doing yeah, the live is. demos. Oh my there gosh. we go. Is that Tim? Did you shave your beard, Tim? <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> not being on the side of me. I don't know how you. Know. <laughs> oh my goodness! See, man. Come on, man. I mean, That's pretty funny. yeah, I appreciate you finding that, but this is just, it's bad, man, of, you know, they need to, I'm going to regress to this dude again because it really so, doesn't anger me. 
again, here's another segue for you boys. Speaking of bad, Andy Dalton has been cleared to start uh, against the Vikings this week. He's off the COVID list. He's off the concussion list, and he has been cleared to start. What's wrong with that? The question is, do we want him to start, or do we want to see the Nooch again, or do we want to see uh, Garrett Gilbert? JT, you want to go first? Um, No. I want Andy Dalton to start. Because you want to lose right. games. <laughs> well, well, that wasn't the reason I was thinking. I think we got. I think he gives us the best chance to win the game. He's definitely okay. better than Danucci. Agreed. Uh, Is he better than Gilbert, though? I think the jury's out on that. Well, I think anybody that's going to have to play behind our line right now is going to have some problems trying to uh, run in, throw the ball. I think it's just going to yeah. be. Ugly, you're gonna have to rely on the defense and try to hope something happens. Since our defense did play better, by the way. But well, but you lost your top corner. So well, well, so I'm going with and you like this twist. The salary that Andy Dalton has made needs to be earned. He's got a three million dollar salary. He ain't got very many games left. Put his ass in the damn game. Let him earn his check. These other guys are making six hundred thousand. Other ones making seven hundred thousand. Let, let's get this three th- this three million and figure out if we need to bring him back. <laughs> he signed a one year okay. deal. Yeah, let's let's let him earn it. Yes. Come on back. And if we got to re-sign him to be the backup next year, great. But we need to see if he really can play um, or not. Um, that's that's interesting because because I wouldn't have picked Andy. I would have picked Garrett Gilbert. Um. And I think that's because I had, I, I guess for me, I'd seen enough. Um, I, and I know it was really kind of only like two halves of two games, but it seemed to me that for whatever reason, um, the playbook seemed to shrink when Andy Dalton was in there. We went from... Dak having, you know, full range of the offense. Then you get to Dalton, and it seemed like we put in Danucci as far as, like, what the play calling was. Just like, hey, uh, here's some hitches. We're doing real simple stuff, not too many checks. And then we get Garrett Gilbert in the game against the Steelers. And it seemed like he had a little more reign of what was going on. It looked more like a... NFL offense. Did you and see I'm, these dudes get hit though? All of them. Sure, but one of them, one of them made it through the game, and the other one didn't. So, <laughs> I mean, I understand he got hit in the head, but Garrett Gilbert didn't play terribly. No. And, no. and here's the deal. Here's the deal with the starting quarterbacks. Andy Dalton needs to start if you're if you, if you're Andy Dalton, uh, because you're gonna you're trying to you're still trying to showcase yourself for a contract next year with another team to be their starter. He is not coming back to the Cowboys, even if he plays lights out. He will not be back with the Cowboys because they are not going to pay him to be uh, another three and a half or four million dollars to be a backup. He's going somewhere to be a starter. That's well, if that's the case. Then where? So, but if you are the Cowboys, Chicago, you've got God. They need a quarterback so bad. Mm. Yeah, we can talk about that Monday night game mm-hmm. if y'all want a little bit later. But good <laughs> God, that was. Ugly. Um, if if you're the Cowboys, you've got your potential backup next year, in Garrett Gilbert, and he's going to be cheap. But you got to see what he can do. You can't just throw him out there one game behind a terrible offensive line. Granted. Oh it was a good God. game. Y'all are giving me headaches. How many teams has Garrett Gilbert played on already? What's that? How many teams has he played on already? Garrett Gilbert. Oh, I good mean, Lord. Anyway, less than, you know less than Josh McCown, but Josh McCown is still a better option than, than what we got. Oh, is he? Yes. All right. Oh, man. This Josh McCown has played for everybody. Matt Flynn even played for everybody. And True. apparently, everybody thinks that Matt Flynn is a pretty doggone good quarterback. Maybe that's why he keeps getting jobs. 
I see no. now. We're, we're going to have to have. I'm going to have to do evaluation period with you guys. We're just going to have to catch up on a. I don't know what it is. A, a Saturday morning, a Sunday night, something, and just break out the film and let's really okay. Just well, let me talk. Let about me ask that. you this then about playing for all these different teams. Is Ryan Fitzpatrick better than any quarterback we have on the roster right now? Yes. Yes. Able to play. Yes. How many teams has he played for? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> but he's producing. Gilbert ain't produced nothing. I don't know, man. That's a pretty good game against pretty good defense. The the best of defenses, one might add. No film out on him. Nobody knows what the hell he can do. That happens. I need somebody to loan me money for all 22 so I can buy that. Yeah, we don't know what. Uh, oh, geez. Alabama news. We got to get some Alabama news on Teague's take. All right. And Waddle's getting his cast off. He might be ready for the playoffs if Alabama gets there. Um, should he play? Did you just say if Alabama gets there? I'm just throwing that out there because you know what? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Oh my gosh, you're good tonight, man. I don't know what's going on. That, that Dr. Pepper, is that Dr. Pepper? That's Dr. Pepper 23, or what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it is 23. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And his shirt says Mossy. Come on, man. What, what is going on here? You got mossed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I'm just saying. So, he's a junior. And uh, George and your vast Alabama network of insiders, have you heard anything about him coming out after this year or playing a senior year at Alabama? Uh, yes, I have heard about him coming out this year because he's projected to be pretty high um, yep. draft pick. Uh, but do I think that he should play if he has an opportunity to uh, this year in the playoffs or something? I I'm going to say yes, I would like to see him play uh, for a couple of reasons. and not selfish ones in that. It's one, if he does have the projections – if he's healthy and he feels good about it and he's rehabbing, he needs to play because, one, it can solidify whether or not he should be a first-round draft pick this year or not. So the scouts will love that and the doctors will love that. And Because if he doesn't play and he's perceived to be healthy, um, then and he goes into the draft without playing, uh, he'll start slipping. It could be some old C.D. Lamb type stuff. I think he will. Because people will make excuses all the time just because of that. Broke the foot, we didn't get to see him run. We don't know if he can cut. We don't know if he can turn. You know, we ain't get a rub on the ankle hard enough or whatever it is. Um, I mean, two had a career-threatening injury, and he didn't slip, I don't think, in the draft. Christian mm -hmm. McCaffrey literally just sat out because he felt like it, and he's yeah. fine. Mm, what are you oh, you're talking about from – In the draft. Him? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that he should only come back if and only if he feels he is 110% healthy. Mm -hmm. Anything less than that, you're you're already projected to be a first round pick. Just like Jamar Chase, Jamar Chase is still going to be a first round pick. He ain't played not one snap this year. Just chill out, get better. Show out in the well. I don't even know. He probably not even gonna run at the combine. Why would you? He, we already know he's fast. It's super fast. So maybe don't even do that. Just maybe come out and catch a few balls. And I know. mean, if they even have a combine. Yeah, just just ride your draft stock because, especially in this kind of year where you got all these other receivers that aren't playing at all. I mean, Rashad Bateman is probably actually doing himself a disservice. He sat out, and then he came back once the uh, once the Big Ten decided they were going to play, and he's not looking great. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if, if I were him, I mean, obviously I want him back because Alabama's offense goes from great to elite when Jalen Waddle's on the field. But – if I'm Jalen Waddle, if I don't feel that I'm 100% back to where I was before Tennessee, I would, I would call it quits and just rehab and make sure that I am right. So then when I do have to go through all those evaluations, if I, if I show any kind of hitch in my step, 
coming back, I think that does more harm than just not showing that. Right. And having yeah. your pro day. Oh, I can hear that. I mean, I, I'm I'm definitely a proponent of both sides. Um, but I don't know. And, and I know these Bama guys too. They're 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 not ones just to lay it down and just say I'm not gonna go. I I don't know. I, and knowing Waddle the way he, he is to me is I think it would be hard for him to just cheer. But I don't know. You know, I think he's gonna want to run one more punt return back for a touchdown or catch one more bomb with the boys mm-hmm. and go win another national championship. If they made a the national championship game and he's healthy, he's probably gonna gonna want to get out there. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. There's no that. question. So again, it's it's only if he feels like it. It's the only way he mm-hmm. should do it. Mm-hmm. Not in any game and on any, at any rate. So speaking of playoffs, George, why don't you fill us in a little bit on what's going on in the uh, Taps football playoffs here in Texas? Yeah, and I wish I knew how to do this fancy work that uh, JT did to show you these. Um, Brackets, but you know it's going to be interesting this week. Uh, yeah, it's on taps.biz. Uh, oh, bracket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so um, the playoffs start for UIL <laughs> and Taps, but for Taps we got um, the brackets are set. First of all, John Paul II High School is going to be playing Concordia Lutheran this Friday night. Uh, I am. Projecting that JP2 wins that game to advance uh, to play Nolan Catholic in the second round. Nolan is the number one seed. They did beat, I don't know if you would call it an upset or not, but they did beat Parish Episcopal uh, 31 to 14, uh, which Parish was the number one um, private school in the state. And they got beat by Nolan. So that was a very big game, putting Nolan at two. Um, Preston would beat us at John Paul last week, making them three and making uh, JP two four. Midland Christian five, uh, Liberty Christian is six. Uh, All Saints Episcopal over in Fort Worth is seven, and then Bishop Lynch being eight. Uh, so the matchups: Nolan with the bye, JP two Concordia Lutheran, Liberty Christian playing Central Catholic High School um, out of San Antonio. I'm going to take Central Classic to win that game. All Saints Episcopal playing the number two seed out of San Antonio. Antonian College Prep. I'm actually going to take a an upset in this one. I'm going to take All Saints Episcopal to beat Antonian um, to advance um, into the regional round next week. I'm going to take Parrish to beat Bishop Lynch. Uh, Preston Wood, unfortunately, um, does have a bye. Uh, because it's weird, right? Because people say, how did the three seed get a buy? Well, I'm saying uh, that because of uh, the, the team that was slotted to be in there actually opted out of <laughs> playing um, in the playoffs. They're, uh, I don't know. As we, I think it would be kind of hard for me as a coach just to say, hey, we're not going to play. Yeah. Um, so I have a question uh, for you as a member of the board. Then, mm-hmm. if you have a team that opts out and gives a, uh, um, I'm trying to be nice, uh, but I'm going to use the word undeserving anyway, mm-hmm. a buy. Why not just reseed and give the buy back to your two seed and make the eight seed go play the third seed? Um, because, well, uh, and I, I don't know this to answer because we didn't really discuss it, but the same way Preston Wood found out about them not playing, it was given to us on that Friday <laughs> of last week after the games. They're watching their brackets. It's not cool. You know, you kind of get the sanctions from the schools or whatnot. But anyway, my point is um, we had to certify um, the spots into that on that Saturday. And basically instead of trying to reshuffle everything and everybody, we know that wouldn't have been done on Saturday, probably trying to get the board together and the districts together and try to figure it all out. Not saying it's the right answer. Are they going to lose the draft pick for opting opting out? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. We're just going to move them over to Corpus Christi or wherever uh, Texas is and A&M is and just let them, Stand right next to them. Did he but. say Corpus Christi? <laughs> I did. I'm in Corpus Christi, but yeah. not at Texas A&M. Yeah, but uh, it's the uh, same the school. school. Probably would have been the same. 
you're on the same level. It's the same thing as what he's talking about with the Central Michigan and Michigan. They're not anywhere. Time we beat Alabama. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, Midland Christian is going to be playing St. Pius. I'm picking Midland Christian to win that game. And then St. Thomas has to buy um, also. So it's going to be really interesting to see how many Division One. I, I mean, uh, District 1 schools beat District 2 schools um, because it's going to get, you know, this first round is always pretty in interesting, especially on the, the top half of our uh, brackets. So um, y'all make sure y'all stay tuned to those things because it's going to be kind of interesting, especially the next week because uh, there could be some pretty significant um, matchups uh you know, the, the second round for sure that could really paint the picture on who has a really good chance of becoming a state champion. Um, awesome. Going forward. So it's really, really good. Uh, Y'all just watch the newspapers, watch the Dallas Morning News and all the other places to, to get the local scores. Um, and it'll, it'll be fun to fun to see. So that's it, guys, on our, on our TAPS update. Of course, there is Division II um, football. I think you know, for those that are um, looking at that, ultimately you can look at the bracket. So all teams have been let in for taps. All teams were allowed to go into the playoffs just this year, just because of the COVID deal and the, um, not knowing who's going to be able to play and who isn't and that type of thing. Um, but at division two level, so there is an extra playoff round because of that. I still think the two teams that are going to be in the state championship will be Dallas Christian and Austin Regents <laughs> by the time we get to the end of the um, deal. So awesome. There we go. That's how we have it, man. Appreciate Who it. Up for uh, next week on the show, George, what so, do you need to talk about her? Well, we got another all-star and this is probably uh will shock some people or whatever, but we've been talking about how do we get um, common people like us three on here, right. Uh, to come on. So we do have, uh, Claire Russell coming on next week. Who is Claire Russell? She's the ultimate Fisher, the ultimate Cowboys fan, the ultimate traveler. Uh, she's Texas girl 2009, I believe, um, on Twitter. And she's going to come on and talk Cowboys football and everything else with us. She's just uh, a person that lives up in the country of Texas. And we're just going to have a good time and uh, spend some time with the with the fans. So uh, it's going to be fun to have her uh, next week. She is in our um, street team, which you opted out of playing. She's in our street team uh, fantasy uh, football. Not even doing well in that one league. I think she is the third seed right now. Uh, look at that. She popped on in. She's the third seed. Is me. Then Consuela, then uh, she calls herself Baby Got Dak. How about hold that? On, <laughs> hold on, hold uh, on. You know Andrew's about to Andrew's about to get on you now because oh, Andrew's cause, actually third seed. Oh, Andrew's three. So Andrew, Mc there's Cal a, there's a three way him. tie for third as far as record goes, but uh, Andrew is the one that is. City so he's three. three, and Baby Doc got Dak is four. Nope, and Spoilers two. No, uh, Rick Fair, Rick Flair swag is four, and Baby got Dak is five. Oh, she done fell out. Mm -mm -mm. They're all they all have the same record though. They all have the same record. Okay, well that's good. All who can you tell everybody who's first? Uh, it is real <laughs> slim shady. <laughs> Which, if you don't know who the real Slayer Shady is, yes, it's me. Thank you very much with the grand old record of, I think I'm 9-1. I think that's where we're at right now. You are. So you are. That will be posted on my fantasy, fantasy he, score. He, he don't want to He don't want to talk about our JP2 Coaches League, though. because Oh, yeah, because you job. just beat me yesterday, and, and I have no idea how you beat me. I was like, oh, my gosh. Minnesota defense is balling since you were talking about that, too. I was like, oh, this Minnesota defense is fun to run through this dog old Chicago team. Oh, my gosh. That didn't happen. Look, Claire, she's getting mad now because we're talking about her uh, and her falling <laughs> off because she was doing so good. But that's okay. 
Uh, hopefully, she'll be wearing a George Teague jersey. She did win a. Uh, that's going to make Andrew mad again too, because Clara did get a, a jersey from him. He, well. He's got. He's, he wants to win something so bad. I told him I'll take care of him. I'm gonna hook him up. He's a volleyball coach. He does good things in the community. I just and he knows how to cook chicken very, very well. Smoke chicken. Oh, so yeah. I'm trying to get some of that. So anyway, guys, thank you guys for your time. Let's go ahead and get out of here. And you know, I gotta get the practice. Uh, part, parting too. thoughts on uh the Minnesota Chicago game. Um 14 yards and uh one first down and an entire half of football is um worthy of jail time. And of course, Nick, <laughs> of course, Nick Foles was killed there in the final minute. Yes, um, he was. Not that sure was a bad for and taking off the field or not, but that was a brutal takedown. That was a bad that football guy. game. I mean, it just I, I don't we can talk about that, but the game that I I felt the most pain is in was the Ravens Patriots game with the amount of rain that was coming down. I don't know if you guys saw that, but there's oh, yeah. that could do that. That was awesome. That. So anyway, fellas, man, another great show. Thanks uh, to George Hegeman for that. Claire, we're looking forward to you next week. We'll start promoting that this weekend. And uh, have your A game ready, uh, both in fantasy and for the podcast. Absolutely. You want to say thanks again to all of our sponsors, uh, Meat Church, ProfoundSites.com, CowboysSI.com, Cowboy House, the Maverick Bar, Repair Resource, and 3R Graphics. I believe it's at 3R Graphics on Twitter. Is that right, George? That is correct. Uh, and we'll have a spot running for them by next week and uh, have some good things to say about those boys for all the sports graphics. They do the uh, panel board for Georgia's episodes with the guest information and stuff that you see on social media. So big shout out to those boys. We, uh, we appreciate that very much. But until next week, this has been Teague's Take. For George, for JT, for George Hageman, I am Indy Cartem. Until next week, y'all take care of each other. Peace.